So PIE of extreme ultraviolet imagers on board solar orbiter, which is an ESA mission to study sun out of ecliptic. And uh, today uh, he will discuss some of the very interesting observations taken by EUI on board solar orbiter. So let's hear from him. So David, please uh, take over and uh, I will remind you after 40 minutes. So you have total 45 minutes for talk. Thank you, Vayaba, for the introduction and Deepo for the invitation. I'm very honored to talk here. So yes, I'll uh, I'll talk about the extreme ultraviolet imager, the first results from it, uh, our instrument on, on solar orbiter. Now just, yeah. So solar orbiter is a NASA mission, it was said, was launched last year in February uh, from Cape Canaveral by NASA. On the right, you see uh, the, the spacecraft while it was still in the um, in the clean room. And the special thing about Solar Orbiter is that it brings a set of uh, remote sensing instruments. You see them here, uh, close to the sun, that is like uh, below 0 0.3 AU, and that. Uh, being close to the sun requires uh, a big heat shield, the, the black thing you see on the right. But in contrast to Parker Solar Probe, uh, we, this one is differently optimized. So we stay a bit further from the sun. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a reward, we get remote sensing instrument, which needs uh, little peak holes in the heat shield to look through. Now you can imagine that is a, an engineering challenge to have a heat shield with holes in it because the heat will get through the holes, of course. So th this whole thing is a, a design driver for the remote sensing instruments. Uh, each of these ones is, is very interesting, of course, but I, I'll only talk about the instrument I'm involved in, that is the extreme ultraviolet imager, EOI. Now EOI is the size of a, of a shoebox. <clears throat> well, for big feet and a big shoebox. <laughs> uh, and it contains uh, three telescopes, the full sun imager and two high resolution imagers. And because of these little peak holes in the, in the heat shield, our apertures of our, of our telescopes are really tiny. They're much smaller than, than what SDO has, for example. And therefore everything inside, the mirrors, the filters, everything is optimized for uh, maximal throughput. And also the selection of the wavelengths is, uh, is such that we essentially we, we, we have chosen the, the brightest lines in the, in the um, UV and in the UV. So that's uh, 17.4 and 30.4 30 nanometers in, uh, in the EUV. You know, this wavelength from previous EUV imagers, but there is also the, the Lyman Alpha telescope here uh, since Lyman Alpha is, is really bright. It so happens that these bright lines, they give us the, uh, the interface layer, the low corona through the high chromosphere transition region, uh, where lots of fun is happening, as you will see. Um, in this talk, I'll be presenting essentially the results from uh, three papers. And I just flashed them up here because to show you the long list of uh, co-authors. All of these people have contributed in an essential way, one or the other. Uh, in principle, they should be all on the on the first slide as co-authors of the talk, but that gets a bit complicated. But uh, I'm I'm very much indebted to uh, what is essentially here the EOI team. Okay, what I'll be showing is oh no, first is so our first light observations. Uh, were taken on May 12th last year at a distance of 0 0.6 and a bit AU, so just over halfway towards the sun. And on the left, you see uh, the an image from the full sun imager in 17.4 nanometer. Looks uh, similar to what you know from, from SDO, AIA. And then the inset on the left and zoomed out on the right is a zoom in from the high resolution in the EUV HRI UV in the same wavelength. So that's also 17.4 nanometer. Um, already these very first images were the, the highest resolution ever in the, in the quiet sun. There is another uh, rocket, uh, sounding rocket uh, instrument, IC has been there, which has a, sl a slightly better uh, spatial resolution, but that looked at active regions. 
Now let's let's zoom in a little bit on on what we see there. Uh, so I zoom in on HRIUV, and just to get you oriented, how big things are are here. I show you in the top right there what we call the tardigrades. That is just a flat field component of our sensor. So it, it's not solar. It's it's just a defect in our telescope. But in these uh, images, it is 6.7 megameters by 3.4 megameters. So that's uh, the size of an Earth continent, let's say. Uh, and so the, the pixels in these images are uh, uh, on the order of 200 kilometers each. Um, yep. The, the thing I will be talking about are these little bright flashes uh, in the images. We, um, they're sort of uh, UV brightenings or nanoflares. Um, and it so happens that in an ESA press re release of the first uh, results, uh, I was talking about uh, looking at the coronal scene and seeing little uh, brightenings all over the place that looked as if we were seeing campfires in, in, a, in an earth uh, meadow. And this word campfires got stuck in the popular media and later on also in the scientific lit literature. So now we are talking about uh, campfires. Campfires are little UV brightenings in the solar corona. And as you will see later in this presentation, it's it's uh, not exactly a new phenomena. It's it's the same thing as the nanoflares and the UV brightings that have been seen before. It's just we see them smaller and differently than before. But let's not get ahead of myself. We do step by step. Um, the the results of the three papers that I showed before are based on the same uh, observations. And these were just actually 50 test images taken during the commissioning phase on May 30, um, just halfway ab above halfway the, uh, the distance to the sun. And at 30 degrees away from the sun earth line. So in the little unsets, uh, insets image in the middle, you see that uh, EOI is like 30 degrees away from the sun earth line from uh, as seen by SDO. And also the images in the back, the one on the left is from SDO and the one on the right is from EOI. And if you look at the uh, thick yellow cross that crosses the, the zero longitude and latitude points, that points exactly towards the Earth in this coordinate system. And so on the right, you see it's it's somewhat uh, pointing to the left of us. The campfires, I'm going to show you a few examples so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, here I show a little zoomed in image of 60 by 60 megameters. And the little bright dot there in the middle is, is what we call a campfire. So if I zoom that further in here on the right uh, to a subfield of 10 by 10 megameters, so the, the thing on the right is the size of the white uh, rectangle on the left. Uh, you see that it's about six or seven pixels long and perhaps one or two pixels wide. And remember, a pixel here is 200 kilometers. So that's that's some, a little loop on the length of one megameter and perhaps 400 kilometers wide. Um, what is typical is that in Lyman Alpha, we don't see it uh, essentially at all. Uh, there are some vague indications here and there, but in, um, as a general trend, campfires are not seen in the Lyman Alpha channels, which of course is disappointing, but um, that's the way it is. But we do see them in, in SDO. Um, what I forgot to tell you in the previous slide is that we uh, took careful uh, uh, effort to match the SDO images with the HRI EUV images. And that's just not uh, matching X and Y until the same pixels point to the same thing. But we, we remapped them to Carrington coordinates, meaning that the uh, distance horizontal and vertical, like you see it now here, corresponds to longitude and latitude on the sun for uh, at the same places. Uh, now, when you do that, you have to assume a certain height in the in the corona uh, to which you project the images. And the 
through an iterative pr procedure, I'll, I'll get back to that later, uh, we have chosen a height of 2.8 megameter. So if you see a campfire like here that you see in the HRI UV, but also in AIA 171 in the same place as it is here, uh, it means that the feature is more or less at 2.8 megameter above the photosphere. Uh, if the SDO uh, campfire is somewhat to the left, then it's below that 2.8 megameters. And if it's somewhat to the right, it's above that 2.8 megameters. Um, but here uh, it, it matches uh, nicely. And as a general trend also, the little loops we see in HRI UV, uh, almost resolved or nicely resolved, appear in AIA as, as fat blobs. So they, they are seen, they are there. It's not, not something new that we see, but you would probably have missed most of them in AIA because it's just a local intensity variation, but, but they are there. Uh, what is typically also is that they are the clearest in three or four, uh, bottom right, but there the, the appearance is totally different, uh, which is perhaps expected because it's uh, three or four is, is not a coronal line as, as compared to the others. So this is one example. Uh, here is another example, uh, uh, which is uh, smaller. This is, a, this is actually, from our perspective, the, the most interesting ones. So these are this is a campfire that is essentially only one pixel or perhaps two by two pixels, uh, as you see on the, on the top right. Again, there is no sign whatsoever in the Lyman Alpha. Uh, what you see here is interesting is that the AIA campfire, the correspondence, uh, is offset to the left, which means that this little guy here is below 2.8 megameter in the photosphere. Another example is here. This is more uh, on the big side. So uh, let's say a big campfire. Uh, it's somewhat offset to the right, not much, but, but a little bit. So this would be above 2.8 megameters. Um, and I take this campfire as an example also because it's somewhat interesting if you look at the time evolution. So this is a time evolution over almost three minutes in the HRI UV. You see that it's really, or it looks like a pair of loops, um, especially on the, on the fourth image bottom right, uh, that interacts at a certain place. And that point where they touch is where the brightening actually started. So it, it's, uh, it's very suggestive for uh, a reconnecting pair of, of loops. Um, but this is a, a bigger campfire. So the hypothesis is that the smaller campfires are perhaps similar, but that of course we, we don't really know from this data. Okay. Um, Frederic Orcher, uh, um, EY COI, uh, or COPI, um, developed a wavelet-based detection scheme. So we didn't go counting the campfires by hand, but we ran software on it. And that revealed about 1,500 campfires in our uh, 50 images, uh, 50 images that were five seconds apart. So in total, we're talking about uh, four or five minutes um, that, we, that we hunted campfires. So they are essentially all over the place. I show you here histograms. Uh, whatever histogram we plot, they typically all look like uh, power laws, uh, perhaps not perfect power laws, but um, okay, with a limited sample that we have, you can believe that there are probably more campfires at yet smaller resolutions and at, at the biggest resolutions, we probably miss them because they are so infrequent that they didn't appear in our data set. <clears throat> So we, we have sizes from a few uh, hundred kilometers squared, that's a few pixels, up to a few megameters squared. I, uh, I thought it was interesting that if you look at the sizes on the, on the left of this histogram, you would have the size of Belgium. And just outside the, the range on the right, you would have the size of India. So we're like two orders of magnitude <laughs> different. Um, <clears throat> The cadences are limited by uh, the durations, I must say, are limited by the cadence. Of course, we, we cannot uh, see a campfire if it's living less than 
the time between two images. <clears throat> so it's in the order of uh, tens of seconds. Now, uh, this range <clears throat> of little EOV brightings has been sampled before, of course. Uh, I have mentioned to you the high C instrument, uh, which um, in this paper by uh, Tiwari, there were, uh, they listed a couple of uh, brightenings, not many, like uh, a few, uh, 10, 20 or so, I believe. I plot here two. They tend to be on the bigger side. Uh, and they also tend to be, uh, well, they are all in, in active regions. So that sets it differently from, from what we have here. We see the, uh, the brightenings in, in the quiet sun. Uh, people have seen brightenings in the quiet sun before, of course. Also, uh, this is a paper by Davina Ines and uh, Luca Teriaka some time ago already. Uh, where they spot explosive events by their signature uh, in, in Doppler signal uh, in the spectrograph. I think this was by uh, with uh, uh, CDS. Uh, and they compared their explosive events uh, with uh, what they see in 171 in AIA. And uh, the thing that they see there uh, uh, on the dashed line is definitely something that we would have picked up as a campfire. Now it's again a bit bigger, so it seems like we we extend that range uh, uh, to the lower sizes and lower durations. But of course, from our data set at this stage, we can we cannot claim that all our campfires correspond to explosive events, just because we don't have spectrograph data to to prove that. Last comparison, uh, Pradeep Chita and Hardy Peter published recently uh, EUV bursts on AIA. They essentially did something similar with an automated detection scheme, but on AI on AIA data. And they, uh, given that the resolution is different, they of course find somewhat bigger events and somewhat longer durations. But essentially, their distribution uh, is uh, not incompatible with our distribution. So from what it looks like is that <clears throat> these are essentially the same things. We just extend them to, um, to, to higher resolution, to lower, lower durations and smaller areas. Now let's see what we, what we can learn new. Uh, extending the, the population is nice, but it's not really uh, a big breakthrough. So we looked also to what we can do extra. We can compare, of course, with uh, the Lyman Alpha. I already said that we don't see uh, a correspondence of our EUV campfires to, to brightenings in, in the Lyman Alpha. They're, they're just not there. But we can spot uh, where the EUV campfires happen in the Lyman Alpha scene. So if you look at the, uh, on the left-hand side here, Regina Quadrado from MPS has, uh, has segmented the uh, Lyman Alpha image to reveal the, uh, the chromospheric network. So the brightest areas are those that are uh, above the blue threshold. This is the network core. Then between the red and the blue threshold, she is what she defines the network. And then below the uh, red threshold would be the, the this within the cells of the network. It so happens that the location of the EOV campfires, they are mostly uh, in the middle segment, meaning in the network, but not in the core of the of the network. So that that matches to what is known from explosive events also. They also tend to be in the network, but not in the in the core of it. On the right here, Patrick Antolin uh, um, used the, the, the correspondence that we have between our campfires and the locations in AIA to use the uh, EM uh, software the, 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 to determine temperature and, and emission measures from AIA data. So that is not based on, on the HRI UV data itself, but we only use the location of the HRI campfires uh, in AIA to then plot their emission measure and temperature. <clears throat> um, the 
the gray areas and, and the black dots and also the black histograms is essentially all the AIA pixels in the HRI EOV uh, field of view without making a distinction between campfires or non-campfire pixels. The, the colored red things are is the restriction to only campfire pixels. So the, the message that this graph reveals is that as compared to the to the average pixels, the campfire pixels are slightly hotter, not much, but slightly. And they're also slightly denser in the sense that the emission measure is slightly higher for the campfire pixels than for the other pixels. So this is compatible with a, a heating event that, uh, that rises the temperature and, and subsequently also the density in the, um, in the campfires. Uh, the biggest uh, or, or also core results also is that uh, campfires are indeed coronal temperatures from, because from the HRI UV bandpass, uh, while it peaks at low coronal temperature, it is possible also that it would have been a transition region uh, feature. But so from, from this graph, it looks like it's, it's, they are truly coronal. Um, what I thought was the most interesting thing, uh, and that is something that we, we had not anticipated before the launch actually, is that since solar orbiter is not staying along the Earth's sun line, but making a, a a tour through the solar system, we can do stereoscopy between solar orbiter and AIA. Of course, stereoscopy has been done with the stereo satellites a uh, long time ago in, in full glory. Uh, but the, the EUV, EUVI instrument on, on stereo only has half the resolution of SDO. While already for these first data sets, a, um, EUI on solar orbiter has twice or three times the resolution of, of AIA. Uh, so we, we, we can do essentially for the first time, high resolution stereoscopy. Some, uh, that could not be done before. And we use that to determine the height of the campfires. I, I already told you about these uh, 2.8 megameters that we, through which we optimized the Carrington mapping. And so from this shift towards the left on, and towards the right, uh, we, we already have a first indication of, of the, the campfire heights, but that's, uh, that's just uh, let's say visual appearance was improved by adapting the solar software uh, routines for, for uh, actually the stereo emission to solar orbiter. Uh, and that is what is called on the right here, the manual triangulation. That was work by uh, Marilena Mirla. She looked through the the blue campfires on the left and applied that stereo software to the campfires and determined their their height. Uh, that that was very interesting. Of course, it gave us a first indication, and that was used to optimize around to two point eight megameter height, which no surprisingly is right in the middle of of the graph here, on the right. But it's not uh, practical to, to do that for 1,500 campfires. Uh, therefore, the method was improved by Frederic Ocher and Andrei Zukov to do that automatically. So we, we have height determination uh, for all 1,500 campfires which is not as good as the manual method, it's approximative, but so the figure on the right is, is a demonstration for, for the blue campfires on the left, for which we also have a manual measurement, that the approximation is reasonable. Um, it scales linearly, it's within the error bars that in any case we, we have. So the automatic triangulation, although it is an approximative uh, height determination, for overall statistics, it's it's good enough. That brings me to my next slide, where we, I now show you uh, histograms and scatter plots for the full 1,500 campfires. Uh, the red dots in these scatter plots are the ones that have been uh, determined manually. So you see they're randomly all over the place, 
there is no special um, tendency that they would deviate from from all the other ones so we, we tend to believe the the automatic triangulation and that is uh, that is the subject of the paper by Andrei Zukov that I uh, showed you before. So the, the heights of the campfires, uh, the top left histograms, uh, ranges from, uh, well, yeah, a few hundred kilometers to five megameters. It, it peaks at 2.8 megameters. That's, that's why we optimize for 2.8 megameters. So most campfires will be in exactly the same place in AIA and in uh, HRI UV in the images I showed you. Um, the, um, the height does not uh, have a clear uh, trend with the total intensity. So it's not, it's not the case that the, the higher uh, campfires, those that are higher up in the corona would be brighter in in the euv and therefore presumably hotter we, we don't have that indication at all but a bit what is a bit puzzling is the the middle um, scatter plots where we plot the the lengths of the campfires so most campfires look like little loops and we can determine even automatically their lengths and their length is surprisingly small with respect to the height, or put it differently, the, the height is somewhat highish for the length they have. That is, if you think of uh, bottom left here, of uh, semicircular loops, uh, of course, we don't really know well which point we are triangulated, triangulating for the loops. Uh, but imagine it's, it's the highest point where the cross is. Then you would expect that the loop length is uh, twice as long as the as the height you measure. And if you would, um, that's actually the dashed line in in the scatter plot on the top. Now, if you would put, uh, if you would have triangulated any other point along the loop because it's brighter or for whatever reason because it's better visible or so, then your height would be somewhat smaller. So you would be below the dashed line. So we, we, our expectation was that the dashed line would be an upper limit for all the heights uh, of all campfires. And actually, it's the reverse. The, the dashed line is a lower limit for the campfires. So we, it looks like that uh, we don't, the campfires are not loops of the type as we show in type A, but they, they must be one of the other three categories, B, C, or D. So either the, the loops are elongated vertically, which would make their height much higher than what you would expect from a semicircular loop length. Or we don't see the full length. That's also possible. Perhaps the part of the loops are, are hidden in, in the chromosphere on the transition region. Or we just see the parts that are interacting. And of course, from, from the, uh, the example I've shown to you before, uh, number the, uh, type D or, or even C, look quite plausible. Now there is, a, is another thing with this, uh, with these heights. Uh, heights have been seen before and I show you here two graphs from a paper by uh, Vigo Hanstein and Bart Depontieu and others of what they called uh, uh, UFS loops that stands for uh, unresolved fine structure loops in the transition region observed by uh, iris in this silicon four line and uh, that line corresponds to temperatures below 100,000 degrees I think typically 80,000 degrees or so so it's really more than an order of magnitude cooler than our loops um, yet they are an, at exactly the same heights so the 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 loops that we see are, are very hot coronal loops and they are uh, almost intermingled, or at least neighboring uh, loops that have a, a, a very different temperature, um, like an order of magnitude or more cooler. Um, to, to put that in, in perspective, uh, these authors here, Yai Chen and, and co-authors, they run a MURAM simulation. MURAM is a, is a 3D MHD model code. I've put there a whole bunch of, of details that I must admit I'm not particularly familiar with. 
but the the the, the thing is they have a, a self similar uh, uh, simulation so they, they don't put in a, a magnetogram or anything they just put uh, uh, reasonable assumptions and they run it forever with uh, tri uh, tricks uh, left and right until a self similar coronal looking environment appears and they're pretty successful in that in the sense that the uh, magnetogram that after a while develops top left and the uh, euv corona look pretty convincing realistic it just you can see it at higher resolution and you can see it uh, at different temperatures and in different directions so it's it's a, a very nice complement for uh, the observations um one thing is that their simulations is are limited uh, in size and in duration so they they don't have thousands of of campfires uh but they do receive a few ones so on the top left the blue contours are uh campfires and their statistics in general are uh comparable to our uh, statistics the, the campfire statistics so for as good as we know, these brightings that they see are campfires or are simulated campfires. As I said, the interesting bit now is that you can see it uh, from, from different sites. The left of the screen here is what you just saw before. The right side is the new part. And in particular, the, the thing bottom right is interesting because it shows you the temperature structure horizontally is, is just along the campfire and vertically is height uh, in, in temperature and in density. Now, uh, I'm not sure what, I, what you are seeing because uh, my uh, Zoom screen is not showing this that side of my screen. But if I remember well, what you see there is that uh, the temperature wise is the campfire loop uh, is embedded in much cooler temperature. Um, what is a bit surprising is that the, 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 the density, well, it's not surprising probably. So the, the, the campfire loop is, is hot as a campfire, is hot as the corona and is as dense as the corona or perhaps only slightly denser, but it's just way down uh, below the corona. Uh, here, it's still the Muram simulations. Uh, on the top, you still see campfires. These are, this is not a time sequence. These are different different campfires um, where they show what the, the camp the emission looks like as compared to the loops that correspond to the emission in in the magnetograms and the and the extrapolations at the bottom they essentially find two types of campfires uh, if you look first on on the left two these are uh, campfires where uh, the, ma the magnetic field lines, they originate in one location, but then half of the bundle goes to one place and the other half goes to the other bundle, uh, goes, goes to another place. And what we see as emission is not the full loops, it is the, the contact points between those two bundles. So the, the interpretation is that uh, most of the campfires are component reconnection between such bundles and that the campfires do not show full loops, but only the part that is uh, where this reconnection is taking place. <clears throat> and so th this would be a, a correct or, or, a, or a compatible explanation with what we see is that our loops are, or our campfires are too high to be full loops. Uh, we already uh, hypothesized that uh, we were only seeing part of the loops. And so this seems to be compatible with what the simulations show here. The campfire on the right is a deviating one. There was only one such example in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the simulation where the campfire corresponds to one loop indeed. And it's of an untwisting type, which is sometimes also seen in, uh, in big flares, of course. Uh, but so up till for as far as far as the simulations go, this was a, a, minor, a minority uh, subset. Um, this is essentially where the uh, let's say the the published results so far end. Uh, since then, uh, people outside the EOI 
consortium have taken up the challenge because our, our data is public and have started uh, looking at the dynamics of the campfires. And this, this is unpublished work, so I'll just show a hint of, of what they have been doing with their agreement, of course. Uh, Navdeep Panesar uh, looked again at the campfires and he noticed um, interesting uh, things that the uh, camp many campfires they come associated with a dark feature that seems to rise as the campfire uh, ignites so where you see the the white arrow here is a, a cool structure that uh, that uh, rises upwards and he sees that not only in this particular campfire but uh, in, in in quite a number of them of course, this is hard to prove whether it exists for all 1,500 ones, but it seems to be a significant subset. Um, and of course, this is somewhat reminiscent of a uh, of a filament eruption. And then you have in the standard flare model, you would have a flare uh, below the rising filament. So perhaps some campfires are are um, are a miniature version of that. He he also looked at the. Um, uh, HMI uh, magnetograms uh, for this data set. Um, and he saw that in, in many of the uh, campfires, there is a, the, the magnetic foot points are, are um, moving towards e each other as the campfire ignites. So there is a flux coalescence. This is another paper by uh, Zheng Yu Hu and Hu Tian, um, which uh, interprets uh, campfires. Again, not all of them because it's it's manual visual work, but but uh, again many as as microjets. So many campfires do not ignite uh, straight at once, but they ignite on one side, and then you see the brightening fill up uh, a mini loop. And that mini loop is typically quite small, but uh, I think in the cases that they studied, they picked the, the longer ones. You, re you really see uh, what they call microjets uh, at one stage, at one side. And in some cases you have blobs moving upwards. So the, the, gr the green arrows indicate here the direction of the campfire uh, brightening, the direction the microjet goes off. The blue arrows point towards the uh, the foot point of the microjets and the red arrows they point to the the blobs um, in in the microjet. I've got one more of this. Pradeep Chita uh, studied campfires in in a similar way, but took it a bit further and a bit differently. So he, he really looked at the the smallest the the, the biggest jets I must say uh, among the campfires, and he made uh, uh, time distance analyses. And this this uh, particular one is is his uh, his biggest example, and therefore also the clearest. Um, where he he also studies this as as jets, but he, he sees in his time distance plots he sees in in several cases he he sees bidirectional jets, with outflows traveling at uh, something that looks like the local sound speeds, and it's repetitive also. Um, he did not interpret that as as uh, as MHD waves. He interprets it as Pradeep Chita, <laughs> but no, Pradeep Chita interprets it as as uh, recurrent jet activity. Um, and I, I think this is uh, we have not seen the the end of of the this work here, or, or this analysis. Uh, up till now, we've also had quite limited data sets, and so. Um, this will continue when solar orbiter goes closer to the sun and we have more data to work on. This is my uh, summary slide. <clears throat> Our campfire is a new class of EUV, EUV brightenings. I, I want to make that clear. It's not because we have invented a fancy new name that we are claim, claiming that this is something totally new. No. Campfires belong to the flare family. They are uh, similar as EUV brightenings that have been seen by other instruments. Uh, if you want, you can call them nano flares. Um, the thing that is new is that HRI UV sees them differently. We see them at smaller scales and better resolved. Uh, 
than ever before. Um, HRI UV can also see them away from the sun earth line. That is also something new. Uh, and that allows triangulation. And therefore we can say something about the height structure in the of the campfires. They are remarkably low in the transition region and not the full loop is brightening up. It's only part of the loop that we see. The simulations have indicated that we are probably looking at component reconnection where loops interact. I have two more slides for you, Buff. I'm <laughs> almost finished. Uh, forward looking, uh, what do campfires look dynamically? Uh, I, I must admit I've uh, recycled this slide from a previous presentation. By now we have looked dynamically, uh, but I don't think the story has ended. Uh, for example, the jets, we, in principle, one could look at the height evolution of the jet and see if it's really going upward. Uh, who knows it's, uh, what, what it's doing? So I think more work can be done there. What has not been explored uh, fully or, or not even half is whether these events contribute significantly to coronal heating. Uh, there is, of course, this theory that if there are, if the uh, power law uh, uh, slope is steep enough, then there are enough small events to explain the coronal heating. Uh, we are not sure yet if our campfire slope is steeper than what was there before. Uh, depending on, on our parameters of our detection scheme, we make it steeper or not steeper, and it's it's very hard to make this objective. Um, we can wonder also if whether we have reached the, the minimal flare scale. Uh, are there still smaller campfires? Our power law of, of our uh, sizes suggests that there would still be smaller. At the other hand, our, our campfires are only a few megameters above the photosphere. Uh, if they would still be lower down, <laughs> it would be hard to imagine where to find and they can hardly be within the photosphere. Um, what has to be explored also is what the relation is of these campfires to, to all the previous events that have been observed. In particular, the explosive events, I think, would be very interesting to, to find. If, if they are the same or, or, or subcategories of one another, who knows? So in, in the next year, 2022, our science phase starts. Actually, all I've shown up till now is just from commissioning and cruise phase data. Science starts next year. We will have uh, a passage through a perihelion below 0 0.3 AU. So we'll have higher resolution than before. And we are already planning joint observations with uh, whatever other instrument we, uh, we uh, can collaborate with. In particular, particular spectrographs, of course, are very much um, uh, wanted. And also ground-based data, uh, given their higher resolution, would be quite interesting. If you want to look for yourself, EOI has an open data policy. Uh, my favorite way to look at uh, EOI images is using GHILI Viewer. If you download that, you need a recent version and install that. You look into the data sets of ROB where you will see Solar Orbiter um, and you, you can look at the data yourself or you look at the native FITS files on our website. Uh, we do a data release like every three months and the latest one is out since the end of June. So that's uh, pretty recent. And that's all I had to show you. Thank you very much for your patience and interest. OK, thank you, uh, David, for giving very nice overview of campfires. Uh, now the talk is open for questions. I uh, request everyone to raise your hands or write your questions in the chat box. So uh, we already have a raised hand uh, by from Abhishek. So Abhishek, please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask hey. a question. Hello, David. I have one, one query. Uh, when we see this triangulated image in your talk in one slide, so it is very clear that these campfires, they occur in a variety of magnetic structures with different length scale. And of course, their magnetic properties and plasma properties are different. So is there any, any unified heating process which is at work? So we can call all of them as a campfire or in the category of campfire? Uh, I think that's that's the key question for for this uh, 
power law uh, extrapolation to explain the, the coronal heating. That only works if, if we are confident that this is the same population that goes on forever and ever. Uh, and therefore, we, we, we do want to know whether it's the same heating mechanism that drives all these brightenings from the biggest flares to the, to the smallest campfires. Uh, I don't have the answer, and the determining the answer is, is pretty hard because from HRI UV alone, we can see them, we, we can locate them very sharply even, but we, we cannot determine temperature or densities from EUI data alone. We just don't have the wavelengths. We, we, we essentially have one channel, the 174, that is observing at very high resolution. And from that, you, you cannot determine what heating process is going on. Okay. Um, so it is open question. Is yeah. yeah. So we must always compare it with, with other data, AIA in this case here, or spectrographs. Uh, and that's that's what we plan uh, in the coming years. Okay. And in one, in one year slide, uh, there is a graph which is showing that uh, frequency of campfire is basically at the length scale of two megameter or something. So essentially it is transition region phenomenon. Uh, so basically we are hitting the transition region most predominantly. Yes, so if you look at the heights above the photosphere, uh, these heights, you, you, would, you would normally expect is this transition region, yes. So we, we are seeing coronal features uh, inside a transition region environment. So are you getting much outflows there? Because if, if you are hitting the transition region, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's why what sparked the interest in the jets also. If if the, if the, if it is transition region that is being heated to coronal temperatures, does that heat and and that energy get out of the transition region? And so these these jets, if they are open on one side, who knows? We we, we are not sure at the moment. Then they then they could release their their hot material inside the corona. Okay, okay, David, thank you. Okay, uh, other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, so, Ritesh, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, David. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. So, my question is regarding your uh, last slide where you mentioned in future the spectroscopic observation will be coordinated. So uh, which one apart from iris will be better uh, because the length scales are very uh, small for these uh, campfire structures? Yes, uh, I think iris is the prime one. Uh, there is also eyes on Hinoda that we will look at, but it doesn't have the, the same resolution, of course. But I, I think that's, that's what we will have to live with in the sense that HRI UV has the highest resolution. That's what makes it unique. And by definition, all the rest has, has worse resolution. So we, we, I think the, the way we will need to operate is that HRI UV identifies the locations and the times where a campfire is happening. And then other instruments will perhaps not see the campfire in its full glory, but they will be able, I hope, to determine the, the plasma environment at that location and, and give a, um, a temperature estimate or a density estimate without really seeing the feature resolved. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess we, we should move on to next question by Dipankar. Dipankar, please unmute yourself and yeah. ask your question. Yeah. Hi, David. As you mentioned, uh, the connection with the explosive events. Uh, and unfortunately for Ritesh also, we don't have another Sumer to look at it. So Sumer would have been the best uh, probably uh, uh, you know, spectral land uh, spatial resolution instrument for, uh, you know, doing this coordinated observation. Um, so my point is actually just more of a comment and discussion is, so of course the, you know, velocity signatures needs to be seen and, you know, the enhancement in the line width and, and so on to characterize these uh, events and also to build a little more statistics. Because with the explosive event, uh, with the Sumer uh, era, I would say uh, it was concluded, you know, it was Luca's uh, thesis and later on also we worked on it. Uh, we found that there are probably not that many, um, you know, events 
uh, in the sun to uh, you know explain coronal heating, uh, quite sun coronal heating. But having said that, you know, Suman has its own limitations because it's a it, it was doing in a raster. So when you do a raster scan, you lose a certain part of the uh, sun, and uh, you know, statistics very much biased. So I think the combination of a good uh, spectrometer and uh, uh, you know uh, in this UV imaging will really enhance the statistics part of it. So I'm actually looking forward to that uh, that particular exercise, which will also answer your this you know the power law uh, mm -hmm. question. Uh, how many uh, such events we have to have sufficient energy to meet the coronal heating uh, requirement. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I think um, Iris, I do not know uh, how much it will be able to address this. Again, the question is where exactly this reconnection is happening. Uh, you see, one good thing also I noticed is uh, confirmation of the explosive event scenario is because of the location. It's mostly happening in the network boundaries. That is where you expect the cancellation event to be more dominant and you have this. But now my concern is unless we have a good temperature coverage in terms of the spectroscopy uh, measurement, we may have some issues. So is there any thought of uh, any SPICE uh, line to be also used? Um, SPICE would of course be in the, the prime candidate to, to compare with. Uh, it so happens that SPICE has problems of, of its own. Uh, every instrument has problems, of course. And so up till now, we, we have not gone into details of how we could use SPICE for this. Um, it, it would be natural, very natural, because Federico Scher is, of course, uh, the, the SPICE uh, lead, and he's also in, in the UI uh, very important. Um, as it looks now, SPICE has problems with, with spatial resolution and with, in particular with uh, Doppler uh, signatures. Um, so so I'm, I'm optimistic that they will resolve it, but it, it could take a bit more time. What you, you said before, I, I think it is true. Even if, even if campfires and explosive events would be 100% the same population, even then, it it will be the case for all sorts of observational and instrumental reasons that result only a partial overlap between the observed populations. So we, we should probably not expect that every campfire has a, an explosive event signature and the, and the reverse. If, if there is an overlap of a few tens of percent, then probably that is com compatible with saying that they are likely the same thing. I agree. I completely agree with it. I mean, it's it's not expected that everything will match even if you use multiple lines and you know yeah. even a spectropolarimetric measurement uh, i guess you know you will be doing that also uh, with some chromospheric uh, you know uh, ground based uh, facility with because ground based can only match the spatial resolution which you uh, which you are achieving uh, with solar orbiter and that too uh, with the next year when you go slightly closer yeah, so I'm looking forward. Of course, the Japanese uh, spectrograph, if it would have been there <laughs> uh, earlier, it would have been uh, also very good, but that probably you have to wait for a few yeah. more years. Yeah. So the, so the solar orbiter science phase starts next year for a period of 10 years. So I, I hope towards the end of that period that, that that Japanese spectrograph will be there. Right. And our instruments still work. So <laughs> there might be a phase in the future where we can do this. Yeah. But this oh. uh, you know, Pradeep's uh, you know, bidirectional jet thing was quite intriguing because you know, to capture the bidirectional jet, it, it's a question of luck because with explosive events, we have seen a number of cases, we see predominantly blue ships. We don't capture the bidirectionality that easily with a spectrometer also because you know, one component always dominates. Yeah. So, uh, so that was quite, quite nice actually. I didn't it's see this results before. It's intriguing, but it seems to be also in, in, in our data a bit exceptional. It, it's definitely not every campfire. Okay. Now about uh, collaborations, let me perhaps add that uh, personally and, and lots of my colleagues, we are over busy with our own instruments. So if, if any one of you out there sees a, a possibility to collaborate or to have joint observations, uh, feel free to contact me and we'll see how we how we can uh, organize it or plan it. Uh, typically, the planning process of Sol Orbiter is, is very slow. So we are now planning the things that we do next year. 
already. So at this stage, we have a vague idea of which days we're going to do what for the largest part of next year. And that planning is totally determined by the, by the orbit of Sol Orbiter. There, there are places in the orbit where we are close. There are places where we are aligned with the Earth. Um, but the thing that we easily forget on Sol Orbiter is that if we want to collaborate with uh, ground-based observatories, our, our observing times need to be uh, correct uh, in, the, in the time of the day, of course, <laughs> for, for the ground-based observatories to see the sun. So that sort of things, uh, it would be good already perhaps to coordinate that even a year in advance. So, yes. if, so feel free to contact me, anyone who, who would like to work on that. Yeah, I was wondering since Dipankar and Nandita are here, um, so we have this ground-based H-alpha instrument. Uh, MUST is also there and in ARIES also we have. So I was wondering just to find, I mean, what Navdeep Panesar has um, was projecting that there is a cool filament type of material very near to the campfire. This is something that we can, uh, you know, think of by looking uh, at high resolution H-alpha images. Uh, I mean, how frequently these are associated with this microfilament concept, which was given by, um, yeah, uh, by, uh, uh, Navdeep Panesar Alfonso. and, and Alfonso. Yeah, Alfonso, I was forgetting the name. Yeah, Alfonso Sterling. So yeah, this is something that I I was thinking. Yeah, yeah. Really. But we need a high resolution. So that's the, you know. Yeah, but uh, no. must. Yeah. Must can do. So, yeah, yeah, must can do that. Yeah, that's what I was saying. So that's why I said Nandita is also Thanks here. Thanks, Rabab, um, uh, for uh, bringing me in. I actually had raised hand. Thanks, yeah, David, okay. for a very interesting, uh, sharing the interesting results on Orbiter. Hello, um, Nandita. Uh, I had the similar uh, question what Vabov was pointing out regarding coordinated observations with ground-based instruments. So what kind of um, uh, observations have been reported so far in relation with the campfires that you have reported today? Uh, if there is any effort and what kind of observations you are looking uh, for in future? Uh, for example, um, uh, I mean, we know spect spectral data is important, but uh, what about uh, imaging, which um, which would be the best wavelength to observe such uh, you know correspondence with campfires? That's what my question was. So the the data that I showed here uh, was taken on May 30, and since since then, uh, Solar Orbiter has traveled uh, ahead of the Earth behind the Sun and is now coming back. So as essentially, since that time, we, we do not have any joint observations with the Earth uh, whatsoever. And we also only have very limited data together with the other solar orbiter instruments, because it's still commissioning in cruise phase. We, we are doing individual tests. So as far as um, joint observations uh, is concerned, we don't have much yet. Okay. Um, this was the only data set where we could compare with SDO uh, and with HMI. Um, and now, um, mid-August, mid we are in quadrature with the Earth again uh, above the uh, East Limp. <clears throat> so from, from this summer onwards, we can again think of doing joint observations. Uh, but the... Uh, our observation times are still quite limited to individual days uh, because of, of the fact that we're not in science phase yet. So if, if we want to plan that something, uh, something like that, we, we should probably have a dedicated discussion for that and, and walk through the calendar of, um, of Solar Orbiter. Okay. Now, now what sort of observations uh, would be interesting? I, I think essentially in this phase, the beginning of the solar orbiter uh, mission, we're interested in anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it would all be fun. Uh, but specifically for the campfires, I think we, uh, we want to look for the connection with all the funny things that happen in the chromosphere and the photosphere. I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Elderman bombs and whatever they are called. I must admit this this was far beyond my horizon for a long time, but uh, by now I, we need to look into that because our campfires are really close to the photosphere and so they, they could be related. It's, it's not crazy. Uh, but essentially at this stage, personally, I have no idea. Uh, 
the way to find out is to take joint observations and, and to look at the data. Okay, thanks, uh, David. I, I think I'll get in touch. Thank you, Nandit. I'm looking forward. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I mean, just, just to comment, I think calcium, uh, because, you know, uh, uh, from Udaipur Solar Observatory in Nandita's place, uh, they have observations in calcium and H alpha both. So I think yeah. calcium will be also quite a useful thing to, uh, you know, focus on. Yeah. Yeah. So this point which you are trying to say that, you know, this is more closer to the photosphere. So what are the, you know, stronger evidence you have that this is not, uh, you know, not transition region phenomena, but happening, uh, you know, lower down? Sorry, Dipo, I, I didn't understand the question. So the, yeah, the my, evidence my is... Point is... You just remarked that uh, it appears that the campfires are happening more closer to the photosphere. Uh, that means, you know, it is a more, uh, you know, low atmospheric phenomena in terms of the reconnection location. See, why I'm asking this is, you know, this has been a debate even for the explosive event study that where exactly is this reconnection happening? So we were looking at, you know, carbon two lines, you know, oxygen six lines and, and so mm -hmm. on. So it appeared at that, that, uh, those times that, you know, it was more low transition uh, line, which were showing larger, uh, you know, Doppler shifts behavior. And we were sort of commenting that it is a low transition phenomena, explosive events, not a high transition region or coronal phenomena. Whereas yeah. I, I uh, see that, uh, you know, you just commented that it, there appears that, you know, there is a, uh, you have this height, uh, okay. From the same yeah. transition, like two megameter or something like that. Yeah. I, I think interpreting the, the height of features in terms of their temperature of the spectral line that you're looking at is very misleading. I think that's that's probably one of the of, of the prominent things from from this graph here, where we see a range from zero to six megameters in million degree uh, yeah, plasma, maybe. and at the same time, uh, Vigo Hanstein and collaborators see that at ten thousands degrees, the same range roughly the same distribution. So, so at the same height, you see million degree and 10,000 degree sitting right next to each other. Yeah. But frequency is high in transition region height. Is not it, David? Yeah, but what happens, you know, what uh, David is trying to say is that relating the temperature to a height is also a, a, a problem. Because when you have a localized heating, you can have that localized heating in a lower height atmosphere also. But since you are looking at a filter image, so that filter image is representing that, uh, you know, that plasma, but not necessarily that particular height. So this uh, height information is actually yeah. uh, misleading from one filter image. So if, if you look at this simulation here, for example, where, where this direction is the height, this would be the, the campfire loop. Mm. And it, it's very hot, it's it's million degree, but above it and around it is, is 10,000 degree material. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really sitting inside hot stuff. Yeah. Uh, that means for a time being, being close. Sorry. No, it's not. Sorry, Abhishek, we can't hear you. Uh, that means for, for a certain time period, this TR material, transition region material is heated more or, or something else. No, he's saying that it is not even transition region material, it is lower. It's transition region, if you by go by definition, if you link it with uh, 1000, I mean 2000 uh, kilometer, this is happening even less than 2000 kilometer height. Yeah, but for certain epoch, I think this material is heated due to campfire or something. Yeah, that's what he's saying. Yeah. 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 So, uh, David, I have one more technical question. So you have, uh, you use triangulation primarily to determine the heights of these uh, events, right? But then uh, we are looking at different wavelengths like 174 and 171 angstrom. How much difference in the uh, estimation uh, it will make uh, while performing triangulation? Uh, that's a very good question, and uh, there are all other sorts of uncertainties in in this triangulation. And and what you said, it's one of the things that went in these huge error bars. Okay. Um, so, so we have made an estimate of that. Uh, overall, we we don't think it's it it's that is an important uh, contribution. What is an important contribution is the uncertainty we have on the telescope pointings. 
uh, for AIA, you, you have the, the full disk, so you can do a limb fitting, and from that you can determine it pretty accurately. Mm. HRI UV does not have that, uh, so we, we have to make an estimate. Of course, the, the, the spacecraft tells us where, where we are pointing, but we know for a fact that that is inaccurate. Um, we try to improve on that, um, but even then we have seen that observations taken on different days seem to have different deviations. So that is a thermoelastic problem of the telescope mount in the spacecraft. The, 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 the telescope is, is, is uh, pointing, is changing from day to day, a, a very tiny little bit, of course, but even that tiny little bit makes a huge difference for these error bars. Okay, great. So maybe you can take last question from Virender. So Virender, please go ahead and ask your question. Hello, David. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, my question is a much more uh, trivial one, uh, you can say. So these campfire-like features, uh, are such features uh, exclusive to UV uh, wavelengths or uh, there are such features in other wavelength bands as well? Any idea? So I, I think uh, every imager being EUV or, or, or other Lyman alpha or H alpha, they have all seen small scale brightenings. And typically the small scale is a couple of pixels for each of these uh, things. So it's, it's definitely not that, that we are unique in this, um, but of course a brightening in a different wavelength is just a different phenomena. Uh, so uh, for example, in three or four, one, one has been studying blinkers uh, with CDS and EIT and others. Uh, we don't know if those blinkers are the same as big campfires. Uh, we have to we have to study that. It's likely, but essentially we don't know. We already covered the explosive events. There are also active region brightening seen in X-rays. Uh, it is likely that if you move the campfires from quiet sun to active region and you look at the biggest one, that they might have an X-ray contribution. But whether that is true to a significant level, we don't know. It, it has to be determined by joint observations. And, and that list goes on forever, actually. I think I could fill the whole page with all kinds of small scale brightenings that everyone has been seeing. Um, the Elderman bombs are, are there also. There are other features in the chromosphere and the photosphere. Um, it, it's, it's a whole zoo. And I think it's, it's appropriate now that we try to clean up the zoo and try to connect them. Uh, but that's going to be the work of years. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, yeah, if there are no further questions, uh, do you have uh, the debunker? Yeah, just okay, a fine. final comment I wanted to make for uh, for the students also who are on board, so, because David is a very old, uh, old friend of mine, uh, but his uh, PhD thesis did not have a single uh, you know, observational image in his, I still have a copy of your thesis, David. So, only equations. <laughs> <laughs> only equations. So he was a perfect, uh, you know, theoretician uh, for his entire PhD, uh, you know, uh, at, at KU Leuven. And he got a job in ROB. So he took up that job. And uh, subsequently, of course, he has led uh, many such uh, instruments uh, uh, in, in Prova, now in Solar Orbiter. And then probably something more coming in near future from ESA missions. So I think it's a it's a classic example um, of a uh, astrophysicist. I would say uh, I normally try to you know tell this to my students that in astronomy, uh, thankfully, we don't make such distinction now theory and observation. It is very important that you have a good exposure in both. And David is a classic example of that. I mean, his entire uh, early career is based on pure uh, theoretical calculation and only equations, as you said, David. It's very analytical, actually. Uh, very analytical. Of course, some numerics are there uh, as well. But uh, the transition he has made in his career is, is uh, actually remarkable. Remarkable. Uh, very well done, David. <laughs> I sometimes joke that I started as a, a very almost mathematician and degraded slowly into a theoretical astronomer and then degraded further in an observational astronomy and then degraded into an instrumentalist. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm on the edge of becoming or being a manager. So I, there, is, <laughs> there is further evolution downwards. 
Yeah, it's a question is whether you call it upgrade or downgrade. That's a little <laughs> thing, you know. <laughs> it's up to people to decide. <laughs> But Thank it's great fun to, to have with this new instrument to, to see new things and, and, right. Right. and making my hands dirty with data again. That's, that's really fun. Very nice. Okay. Uh, thank you for your nice words, Dipankar. Uh, so um, if there are no further questions, let us thank uh, uh, David again. And uh, thank you, David. Uh, and then, yeah. For all others, we'll see next week uh, with a new seminar. Okay, then see you and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.